this is probably the most popular small do-it-yourself speaker that's ever been conceived. And the designer, Paul Carmody, probably knew he had something special on his hands when he named these the Overnight Sensations. I built this pair from a flat pack over 10 years ago, and they still sound great. But what if you wanted to throw a curve at it? In this video, I'm going to show you how to turn this into this. Hi, I'm Thomas, and this is Zarbo Audio Projects. Let's get started. The first thing you need to do if you're going to redesign the enclosure of any speaker is to determine the volume of the existing cabinet. The Overnight Sensations cabinet is about 6 inches wide, 9 inches high, and 8 3 8 inches deep, which if you subtract the 1 half inch material it's made out of, comes to about 4.8 liters. All I really plan to do is go taller and taper the rear. So after some fiddling around in Basebox Pro, I came up with a cabinet that is 12 and a half inches tall. 7.5 inches deep and the same 6 inches wide. That gives me just under 4.9 liters, which is close enough to the original. Before I start cutting wood, I like to make a cabinet drawing. This shows me how the individual pieces are going to fit together, as well as dimensions and how many of each I need. In this case, the front and back panels will be sandwiched by the top and bottom panels. Now I've made lots of curved speakers over the years, ranging from simple curved side cabinets similar to the ones we're building today, to totally nutso cabinets, where the only flat panel on it was the bottom. But they're all basically variations on a theme. You have an inner rigid framework that has all the curves already cut into them, and then you glue on your layers of thin HDF to cover those curves. It's almost that simple. Alright, maybe calling all of that simple is pushing it just a touch. Well, let's just say that the process is straightforward. I like to use 1 8 inch high density fiberboard or HDF for the curved parts because it's rigid but still bends fairly well. For these curvy overnight sensations we'll use 3 layers of HDF per side which will give us a sidewall thickness of 3 8 of an inch. And I can already see the comments pouring in. Hey big guy, 3 8 of an inch doesn't sound like it's going to be thick enough, that cabinet's going to ring like a bell. Well, keep watching to find out if you're right. The knuckle test will tell the tale. I need to cut four pieces for the top and bottom, and they need to have the exact same curve. I'll start by cutting four one half inch thick blanks slightly wider than they need to be, and then I'll mark the location on the front and back on one board and draw a curve on one side. You could try and draw this freehand, but I find that a thin piece of HDF actually works well for creating these curves. You don't want any sharp bends, just a gradual arc. There, that works. Now I'll rough cut this on the bandsaw. You can use a jigsaw if that's what you have. Just be sure to leave the pencil line there. I'll sand the curve nice and easy right up to the line, making sure to sand perpendicular to the pan. I tested frequently to ensure that there were no gaps. Now that I have the curve that I want, I can duplicate it on both sides of a second panel and use that as the template for all the rest. After rough cutting all the rest of the panels, I can use the one with the two perfect curves as the template for a final trim with a router and a half inch flush trim bit. Now that both tops and bottoms are the correct shape, we can cut out the front panels. They're easy because they are just 90 degree cuts. The rear panels, however, will need the angle from the sides transferred to them. Well, let's see, 90 minus 75, looks like about 15 degrees in this case. I cut these blanks the same time I cut the front panels so they would be exactly the same height. But I left them a bit wide so I could sneak up on the correct width. It's time to glue up what I have so far. And I should note that I scuffed the flat surfaces of the MDF for good adhesion. I used Gorilla Glue for these panels and as you can see I glued up both cabinets at the same time. Also, I made sure that the carcass was perpendicular to the table with a square. I used a sheet of wax paper underneath everything to make sure I didn't glue all this stuff to the table. Been there, done that. I need to design a way to mount the crossover inside the cabinet. Rather than just throw it together and shove it in there, I like to have a tidy way to mount my crossovers. And now's the time to do it, before gluing on the sides. So, I came up with this. A little hardwood block with a 1 8 inch notch cut into it into which one end of the crossover board will slide. The other side of the board will be held down on another little block of hardwood with a single screw. 
two things to remember here. Make sure that it will A, fit through the woofer hole, and B, be large enough to hold all the little crossovery bits that you'll need to put on it. Before gluing on the side panels, I had to satisfy a curiosity that was bugging me. The question being, would the curve on the sides be distorted in any way because of the large distance between the top and bottom curved panels? Let's do a dry fit up and place a straight edge on it and find out. Yeah, I figured that would happen. Do you see the gap there? It's a little over an eighth of an inch, so I need to create an internal brace to ensure that the side panels don't distort when they're bent to create the final curve. It's easy enough to do, just follow the same procedures with the top and bottom. I just need to make sure that I leave enough room to fit the crossover board into the bottom. There, that works just fine. Here I'm cutting the side panels that you saw earlier, and as I mentioned, each side will consist of three 1 8 inch HDF panels. That's 12 panels total, and I cut them a touch oversized on the table saw. The smooth side of the panel needs to be scuffed well with sandpaper so the glue will adhere properly. Now it's time to gather some clamps and glue the sides on. I'm rolling on a liberal amount of Type Bond 2 glue between the panels, and I'm using Gorilla Glue to adhere the panels to the carcass. Those boards that I'm using between the clamps and the panels are called calls. I've glued medium grit sandpaper to one side of them so they will grip the side panels and not slip. And for the rear of the enclosure where there's an angle, I also cut the calls on the same angle to allow for a flat surface to clamp to. Here's where the sandpaper really comes into play because those calls would tend to slip off that curve if not for the sandpaper holding it in place. Now that the glue has had a full day to cure, I need to trim the excess HDF from the sides. And there are a couple of ways to do that. You could just cut real close to the cabinet with a jigsaw and then sand the excess off, which I've done before. But this time I'm going to use my purpose-built flush panel trim tool that I made several years back. It's just a trim router with a straight cut bit held in place parallel to a base that rides against the cabinet. Here's how it works. The main thing here is to use a decent amount of force as you press down the base of the tool to the cabinet. If the tool were to tip, then you'd end up gouging the enclosure, and you'd have a boo-boo to patch up. Now I'll give the enclosures a good sanding on my stationary belt sander to get each surface perfectly flat. There is one more thing I want to do before applying the veneer. See the end grain on the one half inch MDF? Here and here. Over time, that will swell as it goes through changes in humidity. That swelling will telegraph through the veneer and appear as a raised portion. To minimize the chances of that happening, I'm going to apply one piece of 1 8 inch HDF to the front of each speaker cabinet. That should constrain the movement enough over time so that it won't be an issue. I've used this technique before in similar situations and it does work. A quick trim with my router. Then I sand it smooth. As usual, there are a few little boo-boos here and there that I need to fill in. I'll make my own wood filler with some wood glue and some of the HDF dust from this very speaker build. Mix it well, then apply with a body filler squeegee and let it harden. Then sand off the excess until it's nice and smooth. The original overnight sensations have a small round over applied to the front baffle on the sides, which I will duplicate on these. I think I'll go with a 3 8 inch round over, as that is about the minimum radius my veneer is comfortable bending around. Speaking of veneer, I'm going to jump right to that process. I did build grills for these speakers. These small light colored dots on the baffle are where I applied auto body filler over the magnets that will hold the grill to the cabinets. You can see they kind of snap right into the correct position when you get the grill close. That's a bit of a process to cover though, and it deserves its own video. So if you'd like to see how I did that, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when that video comes out. With that said, it's time to veneer the cabinets. I used a very thin, fleece-backed veneer that I purchased from AliExpress a few months ago. I've used a similar fleece-backed veneer before on the Epic subwoofer build, and I really liked using it, so I'm going with it again for these. The process is fairly simple. I'll veneer the back first, then the top and bottom at the same time. 
And then the front and sides in one step, thanks to that 3 8 inch roundover I put on there earlier. I use the heat lock iron on method for these speakers. You basically roll the glue on both the veneer and the cabinet, let it dry for a half hour or so, and then position and apply medium to high heat from a regular clothes iron with a cotton cloth in between to prevent scorching of the veneer. Let that fully dry for a day or so. Then I just trim the excess with a razor and putty knife to get close. And then I sanded the veneer flush with a sanding block. It's pretty easy to do, really. Now to create the opening for the vent on the rear. I'll do that with a Falsner bit and the drill press. I had to enlarge this hole just a touch, which I did with a rotary tool and a wood grinder bit. Now it's time to measure, mark up, and drill the recesses and openings for the tweeters. A couple things to remember. First of all, make sure you mark which side of the cabinet is the top. And the other thing is that they need to be mirror imaged. See this tweeter is on the right side of the speaker, on the other speaker it's on the other side. So you want to make sure that you do that mirror imaging on these as you're getting ready to drill the holes. Here I'm measuring and marking the center point of the tweeter. I first create the recess with a larger Falsner bit. Then I finish up by drilling the through hole the same size as the tweeter barrel. I needed to massage the opening just a touch to get a snug fit, which I did with my rotary tool. Time to measure and center punch the location for the wolf root. Now I do need to use the circle jig to create first the recess, then the opening for the woofer. Ooh, goody, I get to use a hammer. Let me make some breathing room and drill the mounting holes for the woofers. There, that works well enough. Time for a final sanding. Tape off the driver openings and then off to shoot some lacquer. I sprayed on close to 20 coats over a few days. The buildup of lacquer will cause the tweeter to fit kind of snug, so I need to carefully sand a bit of the clear from where the tweeter sits flush. There, that's just about right. Before mounting the drivers, I always like to apply some black paint in the outer woofer recess. It gives it a nice dark look between the driver and the cabinet. So you've already seen the crossover board that will hold all the components. Now it's time to get those bits marked out and mounted on the board. My procedure for this is to basically place the larger, heavier inductors on the board and mark out where they're going to go first. I drill a few holes to attach zip ties to hold those heavier components down firmly. Then I fit in the rest of the bits where there's room. Hot glue does the majority of the securing. I just work my way through the components, trying to look at the schematic to make sure I'm getting things approximately where they need to be. There's a definite art to this, and let me just say this, for as nice as my finished cabinets might look, my crossover mojo is pretty low on the rating scale. I just try to get pieces securely mounted and wired up so they won't short out. In the end, they're not too pretty, but that's okay, they just have to work. If you want to see an in-depth overview on how to assemble the Overnight Sensations crossover, check out Toyd's DIY Audio YouTube videos on this. I'll leave links in the description for those. My cat Benson thinks it's time for me to take a break. Alright, you win, little man. I do need to clear my head a bit. This crossover stuff can get a bit overwhelming. My best advice is to go slow and keep checking the schematic to make sure you're on track. Maybe start with the input leads and then connect the components and wires for the tweeter and then for the woofer. My point is it's easy to get confused here. Just keep looking at the schematic and double and triple check what you're doing. It was evening when I started this for instance and I had to stop and finish up the next day because my mind was just getting too boggled down with all of this. Sometimes a good night's sleep can do wonders for your brain. Anyway, let's get these things put together, shall we? I'm just gonna get the screw started a little bit protrude a little bit out the bottom so I can locate the hole more easily. All right, here goes. 
Yeah, this isn't too, too exciting, but I feel like I need to show you what's going on here since it's such a tight fit. After the crossover's in, I give it a shake to ensure that it's in there securely. Then I put about a cantaloupe sized amount of polyfill loosely in the cabinet. Before I can mount the vent, I have to glue it together at 6 inches long. I'm just using some hot glue for this. I need to put a little gasket sealing foam on the inside of the vent flange before I install it. Connecting and installing the terminal plate. Next, I connect the terminals for the tweeter and press fit it into place. It should be snug enough to not need any further sealant. The gasket for the woofer needs to be installed on the driver. Then the terminals connected and in she goes, held in place with four number six black oxide screws. And that is it. Done. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and if you enjoy the content, would you consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell? I would appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.